When Troy called me, I had just come back from the short trip that we made, middle of furlough, uh, made a trip to New Guinea because <laughs> my co-worker, we didn't work alone in this village, that's way too much work for one family to do. We had a co-worker family, they live in California now, but he's been translating in the book of Matthew, trying to complete our New Testament translation so we can print it for the, the Nakwi. That's the name of the village that we worked among, the language group that we worked in in Papua New Guinea. He's just finished the book of Matthew. 28 chapters, that's a little bit long for him to go back and by himself try to read aloud and do a comprehension test, make sure everything's up to snuff before we print it. So he says, hey, Greg, I know you're on furlough, but you feel like going back to New Guinea with me and help me read through the book of Matthew to, with everybody? So I, we were just talking. You know how it is. You start a conversation. You get all the niceties and the updates and the visiting up ahead, and then you ask, can you come and preach? So he, he's just hearing about this Matthew, and the way he leads into his question is, hey, you want to throw together some of those highlights from Matthew and uh, come and share those with Providence in a couple Sundays from now or whatever. I forget what the time it was, but not being very creative myself, I thought, well, that's a good idea. I'll just do that. And that's exactly what we're going to do this morning. We're going to look at the book of Matthew. It's only 28 chapters, so it should not take very long at all. We're going to look at the book of Matthew based on the theme that you see running throughout really all four Gospels. But this one highlights it very, very well. The idea of this invasion, this kingdom invasion, the kingdom of God versus the kingdom of darkness, the kingdom of Satan, good versus evil. This world would love to tell you and I that our real problem is a, it's just a matter of opinions, different opinions. We think one thing, you think another, but it's all relative and no one knows really who's right and who's wrong. We just need to sort it out. We need to be more tolerant of one another and just get along because no one really knows the truth, right? That's, that's kind of the world's message. But that is not the message of the Bible. The conflict is not about differing opinions. It is about good and evil. It is about light and darkness. It is about God and Satan. And it's always been about that. And that's what we see. That's what we see. As Christ comes into the world... Satan is entrenched. He's entrenched today too, but in that day and age, the religious establishment, the pharisaical religious establishment had, <laughs> had the, the fingerprints of Satan all over it, really. I mean, they had the forms of the Old Testament scriptures and what God had said, but it was at a heart level. It, Satan had turned it into a self-promoting ambitious, egocentric religious practice. He had entrenched himself with the Pharisees. He had entrenched himself with the, the Sadducees, which made up the ruling class of the priests. Uh, those turkeys were so secularized. They weren't exactly Hellenistic, but they really had lost any respect for the Scriptures in terms of seeing and believing in the miraculous or angels or anything like that. The, uh, the general population seems to be, as we read the Gospels, pretty lax. Pretty, what's the word that they use in Revelation? Lukewarm. That's, that's what Jesus comes to. A lukewarm and, and hijacked Judaism. <clears throat> but he comes. He slips in. It kind of reminds me of the Normandy invasion. That's really the scale. Satan has this world, and God, this kingdom of light, comes in, and he comes in in the form of a little bitty baby. This is D-Day, only instead of 130,000 people coming in, in the month of June 1944, it, over a, like a million people end up crossing the English Channel in that invasion. This is an invasion of one. God the Father sends the second part of the Trinity, God the Son, as his agent of redemption, his agent of light, and he comes into the world. If you read the opening of John, that's exactly what you read. It's exactly what you read. We're not studying John today. We're going to look at Matthew. So in Matthew, the first chapter opens up, and it highlights this idea that Jesus is the descendant of David. He is the coming king who's going to be sitting on David's throne eternally. Chapter 2 it hits multiple points of how Jesus is the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies. 
that he is exactly who was foretold in coming. Now, these prophecies that you read in Micah and Isaiah, and you'll read them in the uh, book of Psalms, several of them, these prophecies weren't spelled out in black and white. This was a mystery. It was just coy enough, just subtle enough, that in retrospect, you can see exactly that this is who Jesus was supposed to be, who the Savior would look like, and how he would come into the world. But on the front end, you couldn't necessarily tell. Because, guys, this is a sneak attack. Like Eisenhower didn't telegraph to Hitler what his plans were for the invasion of Normandy, God is not advertising to Satan how he's coming and what he's going to do. This is, a, this is something he's unfolding slowly and over time, and it's going to have a real surprise ending. That's why he doesn't spell out everything. But we see in the second chapter of Matthew that he, he is born of a virgin, that he's born in Bethlehem. Now, that one they did actually see coming. Remember, the Magi came, and they knew. They were able to tell him, he's going to be born in Bethlehem, we think. But he's born in Bethlehem, that he was going to come out of Egypt, and that he'd be called a Nazarene. And Matthew tells the story, and he connects everything back to the Old Testament prophecies so that we can understand this is how he was foretold to come. When you get to chapter 3, I'll read the first couple verses of chapter 3. It says, In those days John the Baptist came, preaching in the desert of Judea, and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, rather, is near. It's It's arrived. It really has. No one's seen him yet. He hadn't been introduced, but it won't be long that he's going to point him out. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. The kingdom of God has come upon them. And uh, by the end of chapter 3, you see God himself endorsing Jesus. Remember at the baptism, a dove comes lighting upon him, and in verse 17 it says, And a voice from heaven said, This is my son, whom I love. With him I'm well pleased. Satan's on the alert now. Satan's been notified. Next thing you see in chapter 4, Satan takes him away. Actually, another gospel says that the Holy Spirit takes Jesus away to be tempted. And after 40 years, I'm sorry, 40 years. After 40 days, that's a different story, 40 years. After 40 days of not eating anything in the middle of this desert, Satan comes and gives him his best shot. In a scene that looks a whole lot like the Garden of Eden when, the, when Lucifer comes and tricks Eve into sinning, Satan comes and with three different attempts tries to get, really, Jesus to do the same thing. To change sides. To become loyal to him. His third one is, bow down and worship me. I'll give you this world. I can give you this world. This kingdom of darkness, you'll be my viceroy if you'll just bow down. But he's un- incorruptible. He doesn't fall. He doesn't take the bait like Eve and Adam did. <sighs> Satan fails to darken this light from heaven that has come into the world. By the end of chapter 4, let's look at here. So I think it's uh, verse 16. Read verse 16 with me. Verse 16 and 17 says, it's really quoting Isaiah where he says, The people living in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. Isn't that beautiful? Verse 17 then says, From that time on, Jesus began to preach, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. And that is exactly what he came to do. He brings in healing and he calls some disciples at the end of chapter 4. By chapter 5, he takes his disciples up on top of a mountain and he gives them a sermon, which is really a repudiation, a repudiation of the pharisaical practices of the time. The Jewish religion as it was practiced in that day, kind of point by point, he just keeps poking at them, poking at them. This is wrong, and this is silly, and this is ungodly, and this is not what it's about. Remember the Beatitudes? That's what he opens with. That really, guys, it's about the lowly. It's about the downtrodden. It's about the humble. Those are the people that are going to be blessed, that are going to be great in God's kingdom. Those are the people that will find God's joy and enter into his kingdom. It's not about elbows, throwing elbows and trying to push your way to the top, trying to show off. It's not about one-upmanship. It's not about your righteousness and standing on the street corners, praying your prayers as publicly as you can and as loud to draw as much attention as you can. That is not what God is looking for. Look at uh, 5, verse 20. It says, For I tell you 
that unless your righteousness, this is Jesus talking to the crowds on the mount, he says, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Religious activities and practices will never, he says, get you there. Even the ones that are the best among you don't have a prayer. Your righteousness will have to surpass even the Pharisees. And you know that's the case. Our righteousness has to be the very righteousness of Christ if we're ever going to see the kingdom of God. And the only way you can have the righteousness of Christ is if he does this transaction where he imputes upon himself your sin and then imputes his righteousness to you. It is by grace and through faith that we are saved, not of works, not of religious practices. And you see this foreshadowed, not spelled out, but you see him pointing in this direction to the crowds, even right here in the Sermon on the Mount. By the time you get to chapter 6, I, I love this verse. Well, the whole chapter is amazing. He's talking about it's not about your popularity. It's not about your early possessions. It's not about how comfortable you get or a ladder that you climb. And ultimately, in verse 26, he says, no one can serve two masters. This is where it touches on the kingdom. He says that no one can serve two masters. Either he will hate one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and he'll despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. It just doesn't work. When you hear money, think everything that this world has to offer, everything that money can buy on this planet. All the comforts, all the luxury, all the security, all the prominence, all the ego that you can afford. If you serve that, you can't serve God. And if you're serving God, then you won't be in love with that. We have to choose. Ultimately, in this battle between light and darkness, it's up to us to choose which side we want to, which horse we're going to sit on, which direction we're going to go with this, which road we're going to follow. That's what he pulls out here in Matthew 20, um, 6 and 7. He, he builds on it. Uh, I love, I want to, we have to skip because it is 28 chapters and I got 30 minutes to cover them. So look at chapter 8. After he wraps up this sermon and everybody's dumbfounded, their jaws are on the floor thinking, wow, I've never heard anybody teach quite like this. He's not like the Pharisees. He teaches like someone who has authority. You know why? He has authority. He's come from heaven and he's teaching <laughs> as a prophet, not as a Bible teacher, as a prophet. He's revealing truth to them that is blowing their minds. And by chapter eight, he's curing lepers and, and healing people. Along comes this Roman He's a centurion, and he's got a servant who's sick. And he comes to Jesus and says, I want you to heal my, my servant. Well, this is kind of uncharacteristic of a Roman. But he comes and he talks to Jesus, and Jesus agrees to go with him. And then he says, you know what? Really, Jesus, don't waste your time. You just, I, I know you can heal him. I know you can heal him. Just, just say the word. You don't have to go to my house to heal him. You can heal him from here. Just say the word, and I know he'll be healed. I'll go home and take, you know, take care of him from there. And Jesus says in verse 10 of chapter 8, when Jesus heard this, he was astonished, and he said to those following him, I tell you the truth, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. He was shocked and impressed, and he says, I say to you that many will come from the east and the west and will take their places at the feast with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. And here he's foreshadowing. In just the, what, is that the 8th chapter? Something that we're going to see on the 28th chapter. That his plan is not just for the Jews. This is not just a Jewish thing. He, the kingdom of light, the kingdom of heaven is not just for the Jews. It's for the world. And there's going to be a lot from the east and from the west. The Gentile nations are going to flood into this program with us, is what he's saying. And if you go on, he says, and a lot of the Jews are not going to make it into the kingdom of heaven. Of course, a lot of them will too. He has a heart for the Jews. He has a heart for the Gentile. His heart's for the world. This is all being revealed slowly, unfolded for them over time. And <laughs> all of it is shocking. That is, not, that is counterintuitive to Judaism's uh, suppositions. They, they are not assuming that the Gentiles have a place in God's kingdom. But Jesus knows it, and he's, he's throwing those seeds out there. Jump ahead to chapter 11. John, the Baptist, is in prison. He's about to get his head lobbed off. His, fin his work is finished. He's a young man yet. He's in his 30s. But you know what? His, his job's done. It's time for him to go to heaven. Jesus knows it's coming. And in John 
chapter 11, verse 11. Jesus eulogizes John the Baptist, and this is what he says. He says, I tell you the truth, among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Yet, he says, yet he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Now, there's a perspective on this kingdom of light that's coming into the world. That kingdom and you and me living in that kingdom is incomparably superior and better than what we know and experience here today. That's really, I think, his point. John the Baptist is a great man. He's sacrificed more. He's done more. He's lived out that Sermon on the Mount better than anybody else. There's nobody greater than John the Baptist, Jesus himself is saying. And he says, but yet in the kingdom of heaven, when we were removed from the presence of sin, when we are in glory and surrounded by the glory of God, don't even need a sun. The glory of God's going to light us. There won't be nighttime because he never, he never dims. He never goes out. When we are living in that state, the least in that kingdom will be better than John the Baptist. That's the world we're moving toward is what he's saying. That's what I'm coming to bring to you, the kingdom of God. The least in that kingdom is better than John the Baptist. But John the Baptist, if you tell you, is better than any of the rest of y'all. That's what he's that's his message. That's the world we're moving toward. Look at what he says in verse 12 then. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been forcefully advancing. It's been forcefully advancing. And then he says, and forceful men lay hold of it. This, this kingdom is coming. Nothing's going to stop it. It's coming with the force of heaven. But it also wants a reciprocal response from you and I. God's not going to grab us by the shirt collar and haul us into his kingdom, right? He wants you to choose. He wants you to take that step of faith and say, that's what I want. I don't want this and I don't want that. It takes a forceful man, a forceful woman, a forceful heart to say, you know what? This world and all the counterfeits that Satan has offered, don't need them, don't want them, don't care about them. They're going to burn like firewood someday. Why would I invest my life here and embrace Christ? To embrace not just Christ as your Savior, but embrace Him as your Lord. To embrace Him as your life. As Paul said, for me to live is Christ. And to die is gain. That perspective. Forceful men take hold of it. Uh, if you skip over to the verse, I'm just following my little blue notes, guys. I'm not this smart. I, I just made a note. My next sticky note says we should go to chapter 13. In chapter 13, I'm not going to read it. In chapter 13, there are eight little miniature parables that Jesus uses to describe the kingdom. And when you really kind of you know, look at them all, here's what it basically says. This kingdom is going to be individually accepted, right? The seed scattered in the fields. It's going to be individually accepted. It's going to come in stages. It is going to be bigger than you expect it to be. And it's going to be more valuable than anything else in this universe. The treasure planted in the field, the pearl of great price. These are the parables that he uses to explain this kingdom is awesome. This is what it's about. Chapter 16, Pharisees are resisting. Do you remember the, uh, uh, I think it was chapter 13, I'm skipping it. But now I'm not skipping it. Why do I make notes and not follow them, Troy? Do you have this problem? Do you remember that, uh, the unpardonable sin? The Pharisees come and say, I think it's by the power of Beelzebub, prince of the demons, that he's doing these miracles. And Jesus says, you know what? You can blaspheme against me. You can do anything. But when you say that the Holy Spirit is the devil, <laughs> you know what? There's really just no cure for that one. <laughs> that, that is you ultimately and finally and completely rejecting the truth and calling good evil. And you know, there's no cure for that. If you're going to reject you're going, to, you're going to be condemned. Pharisees have resisted, the apostle, uh, resisted Christ. They continue to resist Christ. But the apostles, on the other hand, those that are following him, they're not apostles yet, they're his disciples. His 12 called disciples are following him. And One day here you see in chapter 16, look at verse 15. Jesus asks them, who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answers, he says, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. 
Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter. It gives him a new name. And on this rock, that's what the name Peter means, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Uh, faith in Jesus and the declaration of that faith in Jesus is the foundation on which this kingdom is coming. Christ is himself going to be the cornerstone. The church is going to be built on top of that, but it's going to be built by people like Peter who believe and who tell others and keep adding to this structure, if you want to use that metaphor. You keep building this church and completing this bride, this eternal temple, the family of God. G Peter is not himself the cornerstone, but he is the prototype of the guy who is willing to confess, Jesus, I know who you are. You are the Savior. You are the Christ. My faith is in you. He says, on this bedrock, I will build my church. Look at verse 19, though. I'll read it again, where it says, I give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. I think what he's saying here is, you guys, what you're going to be doing here on this planet, they don't know he's about to leave, but it's coming. But what you're going to do here as my missionaries, as my ambassadors, you're kind of like the immigration department for the kingdom of God. You could look at it that way, right? We work overseas. We have to deal with immigration departments a lot. Uh, the, the, you're going to be my consulars and my ambassadors here on this planet. And people are going to gain access. You will be this access. You're, you're the key. I think the metaphor of a key says this is the, you're the access point. And you're going to open doors and people will go to heaven. And you know what? By your lackadaisical approach to witnessing, you know what? Some people are going to miss it. I am entrusting to you the job of being my witness here on earth. And what you loose will be loose. What you bind will be bound in some respects. Not that Peter is supposed to choose, pick and choose who goes to heaven. I don't think we get to the pearly gates and Peter stands there holding the key, letting you in or not. He's saying that we as a church have this key. We are the access point for the gospel. God could have used angels to tell the world about him. He chose not to. He chose to give that key to you and me and make us responsible and give us the privilege of glorifying him and earning rewards in heaven someday for the effort that we put into that. Isn't that cool? It's right here in the 16th chapter of Matthew. Go to chapter 17, though. He goes up to the Mount, I don't know, the Mount of Transfiguration, somewhere in southern Israel. They go up top of this mountain, Jesus with three of his disciples, and he reveals to them this light, this glory, the glory of his true identity. His kingdom of glory is shown, and he lights up like a Christmas tree. That's not true. He doesn't light up like He lights up like the sun in all of its radiance. That's what he lights up like. It shows him his true identity. By chapter 19, Peter is asking Jesus about this kingdom and what kind of rewards he should expect, you know. He says, you know, we've left everything to follow you. I'm reading in chapter 19, verse 27. Peter answered him, we have left everything to follow you. What then will there be for us? Listen to Jesus' answer. He says... I tell you the truth, you who think you've sacrificed so much, right? Let me just tell you. At the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or fathers or mother or children or fields for my sake will receive a hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last. Many who are last will be first. This is the economy of the kingdom. You cannot outgive God. You cannot out-sacrifice for God. What God's got in store for you and me is an eternal weight of glory that far outweighs, this is from Corinthians, right? 
far outweighs all of these light and momentary troubles. Right? You can never outgive God. This is our chance. I, I was listening, mm, it was last, uh, it, was, it was, when was Easter? It was the Sunday after Easter. I was in California on my way back from New Guinea with my coworker, and we ended up at his church. And the guy was preaching on the Sermon on the Mount, on the Beatitudes, and he was talking about that last Beatitude about those who suffer. The point he raised there at the very end of his message was so good. He, realized, he, he, he said, you know, this right now, this world that we live in, this is our only opportunity to suffer for Christ. You know, when we get to heaven, we're going to serve him, but we're not going to suffer for him in heaven. When we live in that eternal kingdom and in that perfect state, we're not going to be suffering for him. We'll just be serving him with joy. If you want to suffer for Christ, there's only one place and one moment in time to do that, and that is right here and right now. So we have a golden opportunity to suffer for him. To choose hard things. I'm not talking about jumping in front of cars or doing dumb things. But to, to, to do hard things. To not go the easy route. To do the hard thing. The thing that costs you. The thing that's less comfortable. But to do it for His sake, for the sake of His kingdom, there's a reward for that. A special reward for that. This is our golden opportunity. Don't blow it. I think that's what he's saying here. You... Nobody who sacrifices these things is going to be disappointed with the reward that they'll receive. Now, it's interesting to me that he doesn't tell us what that reward is. He does say that there'll be some who are greater in this kingdom and some who will be least, right? And I, I, think, that there's, I think there's a hint there that our job descriptions, our responsibilities in the kingdom of God are going to be different from one another. And how we live in that eternal state is affected by what we do here and now. Okay, I'm going too slow. We need to go to chapter 20. The disciples are starting to get a little bit competitive. They're all very excited about becoming great in God's kingdom. That's what they want. They want to become great in his kingdom, but they're looking at it the wrong way. They're looking at it a little bit like the Pharisees, throwing the elbows and trying to climb the ladders. And here's what Jesus says to them in chapter 20 and verse 25. He says, he calls them together. He says, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. And their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. And to give his ransom, sorry, to give his life as a ransom for many. That's how it really works. In God's kingdom... Self-promotion, selfish ambition, assertiveness is not how you get ahead. Self-sacrifice, servanthood, those are the achievements that God approves of and that he rewards. Okay, we're skipping a little bit further ahead now to 25. Chapter 25. 23, 24, into 25, Jesus is talking about the end times. We could, we could spend a lot of time there, but we've got to move fast. So I want to just go to 25 and verse 31. He's talking about the end times. And in Matthew 25, verse 31, he says, When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, he will sit on his throne in heavenly glory. It says here, All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people one from another as the shepherds as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. That's a tongue twister. As a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. And then the king will say to those on his right, Come you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. That's really the line that I was wanting to get to. This kingdom is coming. This is God's end game. And this is how he's going to judge. There will only be two groups. Those who are part of his kingdom and those who are not. There will be no middle ground. This is coming and there's no stopping it. This has been predicted, this has been foretold, and this has been planned by God, the creator of heaven and earth. From the beginning which makes it 
unstoppable in every possible sense. Unstoppable, which makes it guaranteed, which makes it reality. If you want to get on with reality, this is the perspective we have to have on the world. This is a battle between light and darkness. And you and me on this little planet are caught in the middle of a struggle between evil and God's good. And we have to pick sides. Verse 20, verses 1 through 4 of chapter 26. When Jesus had finished saying these things, he says to his disciples, as you know the Passover, it's two days away, and the Son of Man will be handed over to be crucified. At this time then, the chief priests and the elders of the people assembled in the place of the high priest, whose name was Caiaphas, and they plotted to arrest Jesus in some sly way and to kill him. Satan has his battle plan too. So far we've been talking about God's. And God's got a great plan, and that's really what it's all about. But you can see here Satan's got his plan too. He wants to kill Jesus. He must reckon that if he can use Caiaphas and, and, and Judas and Pilate and orchestrate this coup d'etat, so to speak, not really, because Jesus is not really in power, but he kind of really is, and Satan knows it. So Satan, if he can just subvert him, if he can kill him, he might be able to ruin his plan by bringing him to a premature death, right? That kind of makes sense if you think about it, because, I mean, he knows that Jesus is the Messiah, which really means he's the second part of the Trinity, he's God. And if that's who he is, then if we can kill him, well, we're fixed, we're done. He's supposed to be timeless, and if I can figure out how to get his physical body killed, maybe he'll just go back up to heaven, I guess. I'm not sure exactly what Satan's thinking, but he's got it in his mind that the way for him to avoid Satan, uh, avoid letting Jesus win is to have him killed. And so he's pulling the strings. He's working in the background, and he's trying to get Jesus killed. <laughs> what he doesn't know is that God has a smarter plan. God's got a surprise ending to this thing. It's the best trick play in human history. Because as Jesus gets him killed, Jesus knows that he's going to be crucified. He knows the Son of Man is going to be handed over to be crucified. He's planning on it. He has set his face as a flint to go to Jerusalem for this to happen. When, G when Peter told him, we skipped it, but when G Peter told him, no, no, that can never be, Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. You're talking from the wrong side of the wrong team. No, this is going to happen. It's got to happen because it is how forgiveness can take place. Christ is going to pay the penalty for the sins of mankind so that God can be just in forgiving us for our sins. He can't just overlook sin. He can't wink at sin because he's pure and he's righteous and he's godly. But he can forgive sins that are paid for. And Jesus is going to bear that cost in his own body by dying on the, on the cross for us. We see his death has a purpose that Satan cannot see. Go to 26, verse 27 and 28. They're in the upper room. He's passing out the elements that we're going to take shortly. 26, Jesus says, take and eat. This is my body. And then he takes the cup and he gives thanks for it, offers it to him saying, drink from it. All of you, this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Jesus knows what's coming and he's walking straight into it. <sighs> then he also says in verse 29, I tell you the truth, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now until the day when I will drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. He's telling them, guys, this itinerant, Ministry, this little road show that we've had going, we're done. No more kicking about Galilee and Judea, healing folks and couch surfing from house to house. I'm not gonna be, I'm not gonna be overnighting with you guys anymore. We're not gonna be having dinners together anymore. At least for a while. Not until that day when we come into my kingdom together. And that day we will pick it up again. Wouldn't that be awesome? I'm gonna look forward to 
sharing a glass of wine or whatever the equivalent is in the kingdom of God. It'd probably be better than wine, don't you think? The nectar of the gods, right? It'll be awesome, whatever we're drinking up there. It's figurative. It's, it's about the fellowship. It's about, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to be sitting at the table with you anymore until then. But to sit around the living room with Jesus in the kingdom of God, that's going to be pretty good. It means that this phase of his ministry is coming to a close, and he knows it. Chapter 27. Verse 11. 2711 says, meanwhile, Jesus stood before the governor. This is after he's been arrested. He's been taken to the Pharisees. They've taken him over to Pilate. The governor of Pilate now asks him or is talking to him. He asks him, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus answers, it is as you say. Okay, I am going to go to the book of John just a little bit because a more complete answer of Jesus is, is given in John chapter 18. He says, it is as you say. But he says, my kingdom is not of this world. In other words, I am not in competition with Caesar. I'm not here to overthrow Caesar. I'm here to overthrow Satan. He's not explicating that he's overthrowing Satan, but you and I know that's his real mission. He is not in competition with Caesar. He's in competition with Satan. They crucify him. Above his head is a sign that reads, Jesus the king of the Jews. It's written in three languages because this is the message that the whole world needs to know. Pilate didn't know that this was God's plan. But this is how God orchestrated it. Jesus is crucified as the king of the Jews and that is who he is. He's the king of the Jews. He's also the king of the Gentiles. He is the king of all of Abraham's spiritual children and we are a children of faith. We are those who come to him in faith and say, you are my savior. You are my righteousness. There is no way that I can be clean before the eyes of God without you, Lord Jesus. He's buried in chapter 28. Three days later, he rises again. He appears to his disciples. It's an arranged meeting in Galilee. It's what he told the girls when he met them there in the garden of Gethsemane. Or no, was it the garden of Gethsemane? But whatever garden the tomb was in. I can't remember what garden that was, but they mistook him for a gardener, and he said, tell the guys, meet me in Galilee, back where this all started, back in the place where I called them to begin with. We're going back. I have something I need to tell them when I get there. They go to Galilee, they meet with him. This is chapter 28, verse 18. Jesus came to them and he said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, and therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Of course, then he left them. He tells them, your job, he already alluded to this, you're going to be my ambassadors you're going to have the keys to this kingdom. I want you to be the access point. I want you to go to the entire world. Now, where's the map? You know, the entire world, they only realized, you know, between India and maybe Great Britain from not, they didn't know sub-Saharan Africa. They only knew the Sahara and north up to maybe the Baltics. That was the world. That's all they knew existed. God knew there was more to it than that. But you can understand why the apostles thought that Jesus might come back in their generation if the 12 of them plus the others that were around, I mean, if everybody spread out, we could reach the world pretty quick. They reckoned they could probably reach it in their generation, and they did. Some of these apostles went to Africa. Some went as far as Persia. These guys went. There's churches that date back to, was it, who went to India? There was one that went down, they, they spread out. Paul was trying to get to Spain, right? They were going for it because they wanted Jesus to come back and they were doing his job. They didn't realize that there was a whole couple other continents around on the other side of the globe. God knew that. He knew that this wasn't going to happen in their generation, but he didn't tell them that. He might know it's not going to happen in our generation, but he doesn't tell us that. And so we push to see the ends of the world reached within our generation. Here's what's really cool too, guys. You know what? It's really just been in the last generation or two that we've even been able to discover the people groups deep into the Amazon jungle, right? 
That's like in the 1950s and 60s that surveys are taking place in the Amazon, finding these people groups that no one's ever discovered before. It's really our generation that has surveyed the vastness of humanity's, what's the right word, hun? Our, our isolation, our segmented <laughs> bits and pieces of our dispersed humanity. Previous generations didn't know how wide that net had, had spread how far that spilled milk could roll. We know, and we're pushing. This is what motivates people to move to places like Papua New Guinea or Ecuador and to reach tribal people. Some of you young guys, I hope you're listening carefully because this is what the kingdom of God is about. This is what you can do with your life. To create friends in heaven and to create a reward for yourself in heaven that will far outweigh any challenge, any difficulty, any, any inconvenience that you'll experience in this world. Okay, we're not quite done with the story. We have to leave the book of Matthew if we're gonna really finish this, guys, because Jesus goes back up to heaven. After he tells them, I'm not gonna leave you, right? After he says, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age, he says, now I'm going to meet you back in Jerusalem. So they walk back. I don't know how many days that takes. That's a couple of days walk to get back up to Jerusalem. They're at the Mount of Olives. You have to go to Acts chapter 1 to read this part of the story. Acts chapter 1. They don't know that he's about to leave. They're all excited that he's going to bring the kingdom in. In Acts chapter 1 and verse 4 he says, guys, don't leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift of my, that my father has promised, which you've heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And he says to him, it is not for you to know the times or the dates that the father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth, he told them. You will be. This is what you will do. Maybe not them. Maybe their children, their grandchildren, their great-grandchildren, their great-great-great-great-great-great-great will be reaching the ends of the earth. That's what history has proven to you and I. It took a couple millennia to get to the ends of the earth and we're Honestly, still not quite there, but we're getting really, really stinking close to reaching the very last people groups on planet Earth with the gospel of Jesus. That is just so exciting. <laughs> that makes me giddy happy that we are getting that close and that the Savior might come again. Let's keep reading. He says, after that, after he said this, he was taken up before their eyes and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going. And suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand there looking up into the sky? The same Jesus who's been taken away from you into heaven will come back in the same way that you have seen him go into heaven. He's coming back. He is coming back. He's waiting for you and me to get our job done. And then he is coming back for his completed bride. And, you know, Jesus wasn't any liar when he told him, I will be with you always, because the Spirit of God did come on the day of Pentecost. Spirit of God, also the Spirit of Christ. We have Christ with us. Christ in our hearts. Christ closer, closer than John experienced Christ in those three years that they traveled together, right? He leaned up against his side at the Last Supper. They were good friends. They'd probably bed down next to one another at Lazarus' house, wherever they were spending the night. But Jesus didn't live inside of his heart. He just walked next to him on the road. We have Christ in our hearts everywhere we go, anywhere in this planet. And he is the life force behind his church as we reach and teach, as we disciple, as we love this dark world, as we spread this light, this kingdom, in a spiritual sense, to the uttermost parts of the world, Christ will come back 
And he will bring in a physical sense this kingdom into a reality that will last forever. In your bulletin, I think we've made lots of little applications, but they haven't been the focus of our time. But you have homework. This is your homework assignment. These are the real applications. And whether you're in a small group and you talk about these, or if you don't attend small group, I would hope that you'll just read these questions. Troy made me write five questions about the sermon. What are some characteristics of the kingdom of darkness and how do you feel it reaching out for you? What are some characteristics of the kingdom of God and in, what are some ways that you experience him? Because it's a person, God reaching out to you. Does the promise of a reward in heaven motivate you? It should. If it, the follow up there is why or why not? I want y'all to think about that one. What are ways you struggle to prioritize God's kingdom? And last question is, how does God's kingdom give you perspective for life today and hope for eternity? A proper view of the reality that we live in the middle of is exactly the medicine we need, is the prescription we need for a successful life. So God, we just close asking you to give us your perspective. Help us to, help us to remove ourselves from the circumstances of Cyprus, Texas, to, to look as if we were standing in heaven, down upon this earth, and to visualize what you're doing and where we fit into your program, Lord. Help us to see what we can do and how we can be a part. We want to make our lives count. We want to do something for you that, that matters for eternity. And that is our prayer. We ask this in your son's name. Son, the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.